Thank you for joining us today, and I'm going to be speaking on the subject of Is China in Final Bible Prophecy? Uh, you can imagine with all that is going on in our world today and the headlines uh, that this is a question that is being sent uh, like a mighty wave. People are concerned about what's going on in our world. China seems to be uh, rising more and more, both in stature and in military posture, and people are curious, does the Bible have anything to say about China in five final Bible prophecy? Uh, the simple answer to that is, I believe strongly so, but more importantly, we're going to take you into the Bible today and address that. Is China in final Bible prophecy? Now, final Bible prophecy actually addresses 15 specific nations that will play an important role in the unfolding of final events. As you have heard me teach through the years, sadly, America is suspiciously absent from that list of nations. Nor do I believe that you can properly interpret Scripture in a way and force America into final Bible prophecy. It is very concerning to me that the nation of America, where I currently live and call home, it seems like something happens in final Bible prophecy that removes her from the stage of the geopolitical agenda found in the book of Revelation and Daniel and so on. But there are three prophetic passages in the Bible that are often associated specifically with the nation of China. And so in today's broadcast, we're going to examine specifically those three Bible passages and discover what the Bible has to say about the modern nation of China and the role that it will play in the end time political agenda. We're going to begin with a text in Revelation chapter 16 as always, if you're new to our channel, uh, always have a Bible, always have a way of taking notes, a pen or a pencil, and always have a highlighter to highlight some of these classic passages that we're studying. Also, if you've not already subscribed uh, to the YouTube channel, be sure to do that. It helps to uh, put the broadcast out to a wider audience and it'll keep you informed uh, if you subscribe also as to every time we download new content, which is typically once every week. Thank you for all of you that are already a part. Revelation chapter 16, beginning to read at verse 12 and reading down through verse 16, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that the kings from the east could march their armies towards the west without hindrance. Now, pause right there and run your highlighter through the kings from the east. Because as you're going to learn today, I believe this is a direct reference to uh, the modern nation or the modern title of the nation that we know as China. And the Bible tells us geographically exactly where their armies are going to march. They're going to march down the dried up riverbed of the Euphrates. Now for those of you who understand world geography, the Euphrates River is one of the single most significant rivers in the Middle East. And many scoffed at a passage that in the last days that the Euphrates River uh, would dry up. That would be like saying the Mississippi here in the United States of America uh, would dry up. People can't imagine that. It's never happened before and it seemingly would never happen. But in recent years, the Euphrates River is drying up. As a matter of fact, there have already been times when the Euphrates River has been so dry that indeed this prophesied riverbed, which will become a military highway for a coalition of nations that are going to attack Israel, 
has been fulfilled just in recent years. I throw that out there because there are many people who in writing uh, to me and messaging to me, they'll make the comment, there's nothing in the Bible or in Bible prophecy that can be proven. Well, please don't say that around intelligent people. You'll just embarrass yourself. The Bible is full of prophecies that have not only come to pass in exact detail as is found in Scripture, but they are provable to individuals with teachable open minds. But this is a passage that is connected, I believe, with the nation of China. Let's read on. The kings from the east could march their armies towards the west without hindrance. Verse 13. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Uh, pause once again. Uh, we find revealed in the book of Revelation, as you've often hear, heard me teach, the unholy trinity, which is Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet. So as I've taught so many times before, when you're reading the book of Revelation, the dragon is Satan, the first beast is the Antichrist, and the second beast is the false prophet. And these three entities will be strongly involved in the persuasions of end time politics, which is already visible in our world today. But Sadly, it's going to increase as we move towards that one world government, that one world leader, that one world monetary system, the one world religion, and a one world military power that will enforce these severe global mandates. Verse 14, they are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to all of the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. Look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready, so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all of the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. Are you ready? Are you living in such a way that when you lay your head to the pillow each and every night that you know you have peace with God? Are you living in victory over sin or is sin living in victory over you? I asked that question just before we begin our study <clears throat> because when I'm done, I'd like to have the privilege of praying with you. Everywhere I go, I meet people who come up to me and say, I found you on YouTube, or I found your podcast channel, or I found you on Facebook or Instagram, and I've been following your teachings, and I want you to know that I prayed the sinner's prayer with you, and God has changed my life. From the time I prayed until now, something dramatic has happened in my life. And many of you that may be watching, I have no way of knowing how far these teachings go. Recently, one had over a million viewers in just a matter of a couple of weeks. You may need Christ, and that's the most important thing today. I'm asking you to patiently stay with me until the end of our time together, and I'd like to pray with you because I want you to know, not hope so, not think so, I want you to know that your heart is right with God and perhaps you don't even know the steps to take. I promise I'll be careful to explain that. And then at the very end, I'd like to pray with you. But as we always do when we begin a study, we take time to pray and let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, I humble my heart in your holy presence and I humble my heart before whoever may be listening. And I pray that you might give us favor in their eyes to teach and to receive the word of God that prepares us for the hours in which we now live. Bible prophecy is so accurate. It is history written before it takes place. 
as we walk into this study and answer the questions that have been sent in. Anoint my mind and my body and my ability to communicate in such a way that these things will be clear and understood by all who listen. I pray specifically that they would live every day ready to meet the Lord. And at the end of our time together, when we pray what many people call a sinner's prayer, give them the faith and the courage to do what they ought to do today. For as Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Let it be that day for many we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. The global geopolitical agenda that was prophesied in the Bible, uh, I've taught on it for over four decades. And every time I say that, uh, I wonder who the old man in the room is. And then it dawns on me, I'm the old man in the room. But indeed, for over four decades and over 50 nations of the world, as I have taught on the Bible and preached its wonderful truths, I have proclaimed those five political agendas that the Bible prophesied about. And for many years, it was scoffed at and mocked. People could not believe that where we are currently would ever happen in our world. But this global political agenda found in Bible prophecy, specifically in Revelation chapter 13, is now proudly paraded before the eyes of the world and now brazenly on display for all to see. Now, if you're one of our new listeners and new students, uh, mark this down if you're curious. Listen to a teaching that I have on all of our social media platforms entitled, The Five Political Agendas of the Last Days. And uh, I'll not take the time to go over them and teach them, but very briefly, they are, the Bible prophesies a political agenda in five steps in Revelation 13. It's also verified in other passages. The Bible tells us that we are headed towards a one world order with a one world leader. And the Bible calls him the Antichrist. The third political agenda is the Bible prophesied that there is coming upon this earth a one world currency. None of these are hard to believe where we live now. Laughed and scoffed at in the infancy of my ministry, but not laughed and scoffed at any longer. And then fourthly, the Bible tells us they will enforce a one world religion. And then the Bible says there will be some type of enforcement agency, whether it's a global military power or a league of military powers, it will be some type of enforcement agency that will carry out these strict mandates under penalty of death. And again, I have much teaching on that. There is an entire teaching entitled, The Five Political Agendas of Bible Prophecy. And when you have a chance, listen to that. There are three prophetic passages in the Bible that are often associated with the modern nation of China, and that's all I'm going to focus on uh, in our study today. I only have one goal, and that is to show you three passages, prophetic passages in the Bible, and we're going to take a look at them, and we're going to review them, and uh, we're going to do our best to uh, show them to you, because I think some of these through the years have been stretched a little out of context. And I want to show you exactly what the, scription, the scriptures say. So let's examine each one and discover what the Bible has to say about the modern nation that we call China and what role, listen carefully, what role will China play in final Bible prophecy? Passage number one, and that is going to be found in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 12. But if you're taking notes, number one, one of the most significant but often neglected passages that mentions China is found in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Let me say that again. Uh, number one, one of the most significant 
but often neglected prophetic passages that mentions China is found in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Now, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, uh, in the Old Testament, and if you're brand new to the Bible, the Bible is not really a book, it's a compilation of 66 books. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. But all of them come together without error. And we have two covenants in the Bible. Very important for you to understand this, especially in light of eschatology or the study of end time events. God in the Bible has a covenant with the nation of Israel. That in particular is found in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we now have a second covenant, and that is God's covenant with the church. I cannot emphasize how important that is for you to understand because you will either interpret or misinterpret Scripture by that piece of knowledge. Always remember that. The Bible has two covenants. And so when you're reading the Bible, you need to ask yourself a question. Is this dealing with the Jews and the nation of Israel, the covenant that God gave through Abraham that has gone forward throughout the ages, the Old Testament by and large, or is this God's New Testament covenant given to Gentile believers and a span of time often referred to as the church age. Isaiah penned his prophetic book uh, between 720 and 680 BC. And in Isaiah's book, let's go to verse 12, Isaiah 49, verse 12, <clears throat> in the King James Version and in the New King James Version, uh, it mentions a nation. Now, depending upon which modern translation uh, you may be studying out of. And uh, again, if you're brand new, uh, listen to our teaching on which translation of the Bible is the most accurate. And in that teaching, and I get a lot of questions on this, uh, I give you five Bibles that I highly recommend as accurate. And then I also give you a list of five Bibles that I recommend you do not buy and do not read, uh, for they are not accurate translations. They are oftentimes paraphrased and have not been written through uh, the guidelines of proper interpretation. They have not had uh, a long list of uh, tenured scholars who come together to give us modern translations that are accurate. And uh, I take a lot of flack for this. Some people think the only Bible that you can use is the King James Version, which I love. I'd put it you know, near the top of my list is my favorite. I, I grew up with that. But can you imagine the arrogance of people who say the King James Bible is the only Bible? I mean, imagine the audacity of that. That of all of the people in the world, of all of the languages in the world, that the only Bible God anointed was in the English language and the King James to boot. That, my friend, is unacceptable at a table of intelligent debate. You have to recognize that God wrote the Bible. The Old Testament, of course, is the manuscripts given to us in Hebrew. Uh, the New Testament, primarily in Greek. We have uh, Aramaic manuscripts. But the Bible is written in Hebrew and in Greek and in Aramaic. Those are the original languages, and all accurate Bibles have to be rendered from Hebrew and from Greek and from Aramaic manuscripts into the languages. So for an individual to say the only Bible God anointed is for people who speak English is just, I'll just leave it at arrogance. But I do prefer uh, the King James or the New King James in this passage in Isaiah because it helps us to see uh, our connection to China. Let's read it. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 12 reading out of the New King James Version, it said, Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinem, or Sinem. Either way is a proper and accepted pronunciation. 
Now, again, some of the modern translations don't give us that specific nation that Isaiah spoke of, uh, Sinem. But let's take a look at what we're talking about because uh, when you have a chance, uh, study the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you Google that, you'll get the history of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The thumbnail of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that a young shepherd boy uh, in the desert was tending to his sheep and he was picking up rocks and throwing them and he passed by a cave and he took a rock and threw it up into this uh, cut out cave like area on a wall there and when he threw the rock he heard something that sounded like pottery breaking and the unique sound caught his attention he crawled up in and investigated and indeed inside the caves of Qumran he found these pots that contained many scrolls and, and manuscripts. And that was found in 1947 and included in that discovery were many scrolls containing the book of Isaiah. And this remarkable discovery was so significant because the scrolls that were uncovered provided irrefutable evidence that the accuracy and the trustworthiness of our modern Bibles uh, was validated. And it was in those scrolls that we got the information uh, of Isaiah and he mentions in verse 12 a specific landmass or nation, Sinem. And it is thought by many scholars that Sinem in Isaiah 49 and 12 is a direct reference to China. Now how do they get that? And from this uh, land of Sinem. Well, in studying, as I began to do some research on this and double check my life notes, uh, according to Strong's Concordance, Sinem is referred to as a distant oriental region in that time. And then in Young's Concordance, he reports Sinem is a people in the Far East, comma, possibly the nation of China and the Chinese people. But when we look at an English dictionary and we find the root uh, sino, S-I-N-O, it's a root that indicates the Chinese. For example, uh, a sinophile, and I know that might be a new word for, for some of you, but people who study the land of China, people who study uh, the Chinese languages, the Chinese culture, Chinese art, etc., etc., uh, they're called cinephiles, just as somebody who uh, does so with France and France's history and culture is called a Francophile. And so a cinephile refers to people immersed in the study of the Chinese culture. And these are just all evidences why scholars believe strongly that the land of Sinem referred to in Isaiah 49 was referring to China. Uh, it is for these reasons that we see that this oriental people, this land, whether it's exactly China or parts of China, this is the first prophetic passage that is oftentimes at the table of debate when eschatology scholars are writing or referring uh, to China in Bible prophecy. Number two, many eschatology scholars identify Revelation chapter 9 and verse 16 as a prophecy of China in the end times. Let me give it to you again for those that uh, take notes. And uh, many times some of the comments that come in uh, when you're giving us the main points of your notes, uh, will you please slow down and will you please repeat it a couple of times uh, because I'm taking uh, diligent notes uh, when I was uh, away this past week, by the way, I had uh, 16 services in uh, the last eight days, which there were two travel days. So those 16 services were actually in six days. But in the last two meetings, I met people in both meetings that uh, had found us on YouTube, had given their hearts to Christ on YouTube. And uh, they sat, both of them sat in the front rows of both of those places where I was speaking one including a Bible conference for a denomination, 
uh, for the Free Will Baptist denomination. I was their guest speaker uh, for their annual conference, and one of our YouTube converts right in there in the front row with their notebook filled with their notes. So let me uh, take your advice and give it to you again. Number two, many eschatology scholars identify Revelation chapter 9 verse 16 as a prophecy of China in the end times. Now let's go uh, to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 and go down to verse 13 and let me read verses 13 through 19 and then we'll explain this. Revelation chapter 9 verses 13 through 19, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Now, here we have the Euphrates River in final Bible prophecy again, and it is found on several occasions. Verse 15, Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. Highlight that in your Bible. 200 million mounted troops. And in my vision I saw the horses and the riders sitting on them. The riders wore armor that was fiery red. Highlight that. Fiery red and dark blue and yellow. Pause right there. Most of you know, and I don't want to... uh, add to this what shouldn't be added, but it's hard not to pause here and realize that China's national colors are red and yellow, fiery red, uh, as interpreted here from the New Living Translation, would be uh, brilliantly accurate. Red and yellow, and then if you'll look in the internet, you'll find that there are Uh, Many military parades where the soldiers are dressed uh, in blue uniforms. Not not all, uh, not exclusively. I've uh, done some homework on that, and the colors vary. But I remember uh, seeing many of the parade pictures, and and one in particular stood out with the red and yellow flag and all of the armies uh, dressed in blue. I couldn't help but think of this passage. And again, I'm not going to make too much out of that, but it's in the Bible, and it sure uh, would seemingly add evidence to the possibility of this being China. Let's read on. The horses had heads like lions, and fire, and smoke, and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. Uh, One-third of all the people on earth were killed by these three plagues by the fire and smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. Their power was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. Now this is a Bible prophecy about either a nation or perhaps an allied group of nations and, uh, you know, the horses that they rode and the description. Uh, you, you cannot necessarily be literal. You know, I always teach you, and I never back away from that, the Bible is meant to be read literally. And so when we see things literal, we should take them as literal, unless the text gives us the ability to perhaps see that God is describing something. You have to remember that John, the author of the book of Revelation, by the way, the book of Revelation written in 95 AD, very important date because those who hold to a, what is called a preterist view, in other words, uh, I know many of you won't understand that, but the preterists are a group of people who believe that we've already gone through the tribulation, we've already gone through the book of Revelation, uh, and all of these things have already happened. Well, 
The problem is, is that the preterist view rests upon uh, these things being fulfilled in A.D. 70 with the dispersion of the Jews. The Jews were dispersed twice uh, in history, A.D. 70 by Titus and the Roman Empire, and then again in A.D. 135. But the fact that we now know, and we didn't know, it, it's been all of these new manuscripts that have been accumulated in recent uh, decades and centuries, whereby we now know. The book of Revelation, once speculated as to when it was written, we now know it was written in A.D. 95. And so, being that the authorship of Revelation is A.D. 95, uh, the tribulation hasn't happened yet. And uh, that's a teaching for another time. I'll come back to that and add uh, meat to the bone. But I want you to know that the author, I mean, let's just, let's just talk about it. John, the author of Revelation, if, if, if Christ in the vision given to John as he's writing the book of Revelation, if he saw modern military equipment, he would have nothing to describe that with other than what they used in military battles of, of that era. And so for him, he's talking about horses, and there's more than one head, and there's fire coming out of its mouth, and there's fire coming out of its tail, and so on. It, it, it is often debated, and, and not by uh, people who are unlettered, by uh, brilliant theologians, respected, notable scholars, that some of the language in the book of Revelation is probably, probably describing some military equipment that the author John had no way of comparing it to anything that was in the world today. So is it possible that what he saw was some type of modern military uh, weaponry that had the ability to, uh, to shoot fire or missiles or nuclear capabilities? Uh, well, we do have planes. We do have modern military equipment that can fire both forward and backward, etc., uh, and who's not to say that the military technology that's in the book of Revelation, we may not have yet seen it, but they will see it in the tribulation era. But the reason why I point this passage out to you and the reason why many scholars uh, feel that this is China and this is China involved in the battle leading up to and uh, Armageddon, all, you know, uh, I need to do a study. I've had many questions on this, and I've already answered those that have asked, but for those of you who are listening now, be sure to subscribe, because coming soon, I am going to do a study on the possible nine wars of end-time Bible prophecy. Many people, you know, they think about Armageddon, and they think there's one great war in uh, final Bible prophecy, but there may be uh, seven to nine wars, and I'm finishing up some of my notes on that, and uh, when I get my research done on that, uh, in the very near future, I'll come back to this, and we're going to talk about the potential nine wars, and many of them, I believe, uh, from uh, my life notes and my research are going to involve nuclear capabilities, and do I uh, believe China is a part of this? I do. And this is one of the passages that I believe provides evidence for us concerning China in these final end time prophecies and battles and wars and takeovers because it mentions specifically the kings of the east and then it mentions with an army of 200 million men plus. Well, China does not have an army of 200 million. They currently have an army. Uh, they openly have paraded uh, armies of, of two million plus. But the current uh, paramount leader, and that's the proper term for referring to uh, the leader of China, he's referred to properly as the paramount leader of China, but he has repeatedly said, and I heard him not long ago on the news with an interpreter in a world forum say, we could amass an army of 200 million men if necessary. I've heard him say that more than once. He openly boasts, and on world stages, he'll say, China 
could put together an army of 200 million men plus. He's the only world leader that has made that boast, and from what we can see, the only world leader who could possibly carry that out. So it is for this reason, this reference of the kings of the East, this reference of 200 million men plus, that many respected eschatology scholars say there's only one nation on the world platform that checks all of these boxes, and it is the nation of China. Now, I mentioned to you that I do have some concerns, and so before I go to the last and we conclude, let me just quickly go over some of my concerns that don't allow me uh, in proper scholarship to be unbendingly dogmatic as I hear some on this subject are. One is that Revelation 9 says nothing of an army uh, from the east, Revelation 9, but it speaks about a demonic horde that destroys a third of mankind. So I, I think there's a strong possibility that this could be a, a coalition of nations and not just China. Now, do I feel pretty strongly that China will be a part of that coalition? I think there's strong biblical evidence, and I feel comfortable in saying yes. And when I see what's going on in our world today, I don't know how anyone from the seat that we have does not see that China is significantly involved. In fact, they may be the most aggressive, threatening nation on the face of the earth right now. A uh, second concern that I have is that the horses that are described, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, an army uh, from China and 200 million mounted on horses that'll come down the Euphrates River. Well, let me tell you a second reason why I have a concern uh, about being, again, unbendingly dogmatic about that. Well, look, look at verse 17. The horses had heads like lions, and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. Uh, what I am concerned about is I don't think you can dogmatically say these are regular horses. Because if anything, verse 17 tells us, if these are horses, these are horses with military technology that none of us have to date seen anything like this. And again, I have a concern about being unbendingly dogmatic because I believe the author of Revelation is doing his best to describe what he sees through the lens of a first century individual who has nothing of modern military uh, to compare these things to. And so I cannot say 1,000% that China is going to have an army on literal horses that will be in excess of 200 million men coming down the Euphrates. Again, you know my uh, belief on being dogmatic. If the scripture gives us the ability to be dogmatic, then I'll be dogmatic. But I think there is some room that we have to allow for uh, what John wrote here and what he was trying to describe. Also, the battle of Revelation chapter 9 uh, occurs after the sixth trumpet judgment. And the battle of Revelation 16 involving the kings of the earth, uh, kings of the east, occurs after the sixth bowl judgment, uh, which is about three and a half years later. So those are some of my concerns in proper biblical interpretation that do not allow me. I cannot as, and there are many, and if I name some of the names in the books that they've written, many of you would recognize uh, these well-known ministries. But I cannot dogmatically say that China is going to have an army of 200 million men plus, even though they boast of it. Uh, it seems like that this is going to be an allied group, a, a coalition uh, that will attack. And to say that those are literal horses, again, when you read the description of the author John, uh, I just don't see how somebody that is properly interpreting Scripture can dogmatically say, these are real horses, and I don't know what weapons they'll have. I just don't think uh, you can be a trustworthy voice uh, with people like yourself if you're going to teach them the Bible and go out on those types 
of limbs. Ultimately, their fight is going to be against God during the tribulation. And the Bible's clear that it'll be a tumultuous time of warfare and disasters and divine judgment. But God has that all under control, just for the record. Uh, go with me into uh, the Old Testament, into the Psalms. And uh, let me show you a prophetic psalm that actually deals with this. And that's Psalm 2. Uh, psalm chapter 2. Verses 2 through 6. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and His anointed. Pause right there. Here's evidence as to why I say I think it's going to be a coalition army. Because there are other passages. You can't take one text out of context pulled out of the full narrative and make dogmatic doctrine. As I've taught you before, you can't do that. Uh, when you read a text in the Bible, you have to read the text within the context and the context within the full narrative and the full narrative within the context of the entire Bible. So when we go to Psalm 2 and we read verses 2 through 6, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together. That's a coalition against the Lord and against His anointed. And this, by the way, is a prophetic psalm that deals with these end time battles that we've been teaching on. Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in His anger and terrifies them in His wrath, saying, I have installed my King on Zion, my holy mountain. Now that is the prophecy of Christ in the second coming, coming to end the battle of Armageddon. The Bible tells us in Revelation, Daniel, Zechariah, that the tribulation period will end with the second coming of Christ. It tells us exactly where he'll come. Geographically, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. Did you know that it's the exact same geographical place where Jesus ascended after the fulfillment of His ministry, after He was crucified, buried, rose again, appeared to masses of people and gave them full assurance of His return. Over 400 times in the Bible, the second coming of Christ is promised and prophesied. And the very same landmass on the Mount of Olives where Christ ascended into heaven as the angel stood there as Christ disappeared into the clouds and said, Why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Christ, in the same manner that you saw Him leave, He will also return. And so exactly on the Mount of Olives where Christ ascended into heaven after His death, burial, and resurrection, it will be the same place that His feet touch in His second coming. And the Bible tells us that by the breath of His mouth, he will destroy these allied nations and Armageddon who are ultimately fighting against God and Israel and the Jewish people and the promised covenants of God. It won't be a, a, a long battle. It'll be instantaneous in the second coming of Christ. We don't know the details as to exactly how he terminates the battle of Armageddon, but the Bible is clear. Christ in the second coming terminates all of the rulers, all of the armies, all of the warfare. It is ended by the glory of His coming and by the breath of His mouth. And He establishes His throne where? On the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that that will be His kingdom seat forever and forever. And uh, lastly, and I close with this, uh, many students of the Bible consider Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16 to possibly refer to China in the end times. Let me give it to you a second time. Number three, and lastly, many students of Bible prophecy consider Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16 to refer to China in the end times. Well, uh, let's go back to the book of Revelation and to uh, the 16th chapter. Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16. 
The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River and it dried up so that the kings from the east could march their armies towards the west without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to all the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. Look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready, so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. I started our study with that passage. I conclude our study with that passage. This passage absolutely prophesies a massive climatic conflict known as the Battle of Armageddon. And it occurs when? At the end of the tribulation. It is the final ending sentence of the tribulation with the second coming of Christ after the sixth bowl judgment. I know I'm getting a lot of questions on uh, what are the bowl judgments, what are the trumpet judgments, etc. And uh, I have some studies already available on that. There will be teachings coming up that will complete that series. But at that time, it's significant, the Euphrates River dries up, allowing the kings of the east, China, and probably coalition nations to attack Israel and invade them in their march towards the absolute elimination of Jews and the Jewish land we call Israel. And it is this Kings of East identification in the Bible that I believe is the most sure bridge of connecting China into final Bible prophecy. Uh, again, there are certain things about it that scholars say dogmatically that I'm not comfortable with being dogmatic about, but I conclude by telling you I personally am convinced that China is a part of this final agenda and they are marching and will gather allied nations. And as sure as I'm sitting here, the Bible teaches this, there is no waffling left or right on this truth. And that truth is these allied nations are going to attack Israel. They are going to, at the end of the tribulation period, have this last battle called the Battle of Armageddon, and Christ will conquer all. Uh, I believe that this end time force from China uh, will be the seventh and final bold judgment that will be poured out. And there are many passages uh, along with that, but it seems almost certain that China is going to be involved and again, in closing, I don't know how you could watch modern news and not see that China is indeed becoming clearer and clearer in the pages of final Bible prophecy. And so in our study today, I've walked you through three of the most significant passages in the Bible that are often debated with China in end time Bible prophecy. I've provided some teaching and some content and some explanation that from this moment forward, and if you need to re-listen a few times, that's fine. That's how many people learn through repetition. But you now have a resource in this study to have a fundamental understanding that Bible prophecy and its prophecy specifically about China, the stage is being set and we're running out of time. And again, the most important question is, are you ready to meet the Lord? Because all believers will be pardoned from the tribulation period. Jesus himself told us that in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. In Revelation 1, 2, and 3, Jesus, through uh, the vision that he gave to John, uh, John pens what we now have, the book of Revelation, 22 chapters. But in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, Jesus is speaking specifically to the church. There are seven literal churches and seven literal letters. But those seven literal churches and literal letters become an absolute model 
as to how the church in the church age would evolve. And in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, Jesus speaking to the church, he said, because you've persevered, speaking to the church, overcoming believers, he said, because you persevered, I will keep you from this hour of testing that is coming upon the whole world. Speaking of the tribulation, he said, I will keep you from this great hour of testing, tribulation, that's coming upon the whole world. He didn't say, I'll keep you in it. He didn't say, I'll keep you during it. He didn't say, I'll keep you through it. He said, I will keep you from it. No born again believer will ever see the Antichrist, will ever see the mark of the beast, nor ever see the battle of Armageddon in person. You are about to be raptured from these coming literal judgments as found in Bible prophecy. The question is, are you ready? And if you're not ready, you can get ready right here, right now. Three things you need to do to be right with God. Number one, recognize your sin. Number two, repent of your sin. Number three, receive Jesus Christ. If you're not sure, maybe you're praying this for the first time, maybe like some I've met on the road who came to me and say, I used to know the Lord, but I wandered far away from God and was living deep in sin, but today I'm coming home. One I met on my recent trip said, I watch every video and I pray the sinner's prayer with you every time. I know I'm saved, but there's something about praying that prayer at the end of the teaching that brings peace and comfort to my heart. Wherever you are, if you need to make peace with God, pray with me right now. And when you're done, go to the website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org, and write me an email and let me know that you prayed. Really important, when you go to the website, lostlamb.org, click on New Beginnings, New Beginnings, and follow the easy prompts because you're important to us and we want to make sure that you're not lost in the shuffle. Everybody's somebody to God and everybody's somebody here at Lost Lamb Association. You're important. Pray this with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, today I recognize my sin and I'm willing to repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus Christ. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. For today I receive Christ alone as Lord and Savior and soon coming King. And by God's grace, today I'm forgiven, today I'm saved, and I vow I will live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.